should start with the good news, which you've obviously already heard, which is that our county has indeed retained its AAA bond rating. This did not come without sacrifice on the part of both our residents and our employees, and it's something that we're proud of because we take our fiscal stewardship very seriously, and I think this just underscores that even in difficult times, our county does what's necessary to keep us on a good, strong, conservative fiscal path. So we do have some warning signs, uh, clouds in the horizon, not of our own making, but of Congress's making, and that, of course, relates to sequestration. But quite frankly, I believe our county can handle that were that to occur, and I'm one of those that don't believe that it will occur. I believe that Congress ultimately faced with putting our country into a recession will make different choices. Uh, and that the lame duck session that will take place, I think, will begin that process of, of putting us on a, a better footing going forward. So I am somewhat optimistic that this nightmare scenario that people envision with sequestration will not take place. But if it were to take place, I believe that our county's fundamentals are strong enough and that we would take the measures necessary to respond to it. Let me spend a moment on what has become one of those hot button issues that our council will now be grappling with uh, next week, and that relates to development in Clarksburg. As some of you may know, the county executive has sent over a suggestion that we act on changing our water and sewer categories, i.e. providing sewer, to development in the Clarksburg area. When the council back in 1994 approved development in Clarksburg, it did so conditionally. It did so saying that before we opened up the last bit of development, we would see what was happening to Ten Mile Creek, which is one of our most fragile and important creeks. And quite frankly, what we have seen to date with respect to the impact of development on that creek has not been particularly pretty. So there's grave concern that were we to go forward uh, with future development in Clarksburg without taking into account what has already taken place to Ten Mile Creek and the development that is proposed immediately adjacent to Ten Mile Creek, the headwaters of Ten Mile Creek, that it would be a significant issue uh, for our environment. It's probably the hot button issue on environment and development that our council will grapple with over the course of the next year. <clears throat> It was, in 1994, a 5-4 vote that had a significant impact on the county executive race at the time. So the history with respect to this issue is very deep. The concerns are, are very serious with respect to it. And of course, the development community is quite eager to proceed there. Um, so the choice that my colleagues and I will be grappling with is whether or not on October 9th, when the planning board comes before us, whether we amend their work plan to have a look at Clarksburg and whether or not we need to change the density that we've allowed in Clarksburg and perhaps allow more density in town center, uh, but take other measures that might uh, preserve the Ten Mile Creek area um, because that is the fundamental issue that we're going to struggle with. So on the one hand, we could take this master plan amendment route, which would probably take a couple of years. Uh, on the other hand, we could look at water and sewer category changes, but that requires a great deal of scientific work as well, and in my judgment, might take a year uh, in and of itself. So we have two has to, that we could choose. We can choose to look at each individual property and decide whether or not there are conditions that we would put on those properties, or we could step back and say we need to look at this in the context of our land use decisions more broadly and look at it through the lens of a master plan amendment. Um, I think this will be uh, a difficult choice for my colleagues, and I would 
project a, a closed vote on that very issue. Uh, I personally am, am meeting with the environmental community, meeting with our, our county officials, meeting with our staff, meeting with the development community, make sure that I understand all the nuances associated with this choice because it's going to be a it's going to be a big deal and it's not something that we have talked about previously and sort of came out of nowhere quite frankly um, and it is a hot button issue I think we've gotten 600 emails uh, in the last uh, four days on this issue which is almost rivals our Pepco emails so it's a it's it's a big deal um, Oh, speaking of PEPCO, so uh, we do have a strike vote, a rejection of, excuse me, a rejection of the contract. Uh, my understanding is that contract negotiations are continuing, notwithstanding the rejection of that contract. Um, I certainly hope that we don't get to a place where we're talking about management having, serving as replacement linemen. Um, my judgment, our nation has seen what happens when we use replacement officials. For those of us that care about football, replacement officials are not a good thing. And replacement linemen would not be a good thing. We need our linemen on the job. And so it is my hope that this issue will get resolved in an appropriate manner and resolved soon. What else can I tell you? I was. Um, Recently, uh, this morning, I was at a ribbon cutting for a Victory Oaks, or Victory Housing, in which we are putting in low-income seniors into a partnership that really was just the best of our community. It was uh, a lovely um, church community that gave its land for this purpose. Uh, it was our federal government uh, poning up uh, $7 million, and it was our county putting in a uh, million dollars to make this happen. So this was the best of uh, the kind of public-private partnership that you can imagine that puts low-income seniors in a place where they can afford to live. And I promise you, these are seniors that have something on the order of twelve to $13,000 a year. Living in Montgomery County on twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a year, uh, not going to happen without help. And so this really was a it was a very uh, heartful, uh, nice moment to be part of. And um, Victory Housing has half of its housing in Montgomery County because of the support they get from Montgomery County. So uh, sometimes we can be pretty critical of our county. Uh, and this, this is one of those times when we need to just sort of collectively pat ourselves on the back and say we are doing the right thing by our residents and, and doing good things for our community. Um, I am hoping to meet with the governor soon on transportation funding questions uh, as well as uh, utility 2.0. Um, we are I'm going to be more formally uh, asking that Montgomery County be a pilot for what a utility ought to look like in the 21st century. And our committee, my committee, is going to be having a session on October 25th when we bring the Energy Future Coalition and leaders in the country to appear before our committee and explain what that would look like. Uh, and how we need to change this paradigm because it is an old paradigm that doesn't serve us well anymore. So I am uh, hoping that uh, to create some momentum whereby uh, as we look at the options of public power, we also look at creating uh, a utility structure that actually serves us into the 21st century creates more reliability, creates more green jobs and economic opportunity, and actually uh, makes Montgomery County a place where people would want to live because it is, in fact, uh, a very reliable electric grid that is more decentralized than our grid today. With that, since we don't have a council meeting tomorrow, why don't I turn it over to you guys and see what's on your mind. Talk about sequestration safety. 
I do. Why? Well, one, I think we have made great strides with respect to diversifying our economy. And two, to the extent to which we see clouds on the horizon, then we would deal with it. So uh, I, sh I had a conversation with our chief administrative officer uh, two days ago you know, in which I said that, you know, we should explore, if this were to come to pass, creating a little reserve fund. So we estimate how much is this going to cost us in terms of lost revenue. And then we basically account for it. So we've got a strong economy, and I'm confident that we can absorb whatever this is. And I'm also confident it's not going to happen. What do you mean by cut the NIH? Even, Even would be able to, the county would be able to weather that without much of, much of a change? Well, is it a pretty picture? No. But is it something we can absorb? Absolutely. And we would. So, and again, I really feel like it is important to make sure that Congress appreciates the impact. It is important that Congress appreciate the impact on the defense industry, which it clearly is beginning to understand, um, and its understanding of how it would ravage social safety net programs, uh, as well as leading institutions like NIH. And I do believe that it is when you get to the brink that you realize you must pull back. And to the extent to which this, is, this election is about what path to, to, uh, we are going to follow, I believe that makes the choices easier. Up until this point, everybody's playing a game of chicken. And, and now, after the election, somebody's going to have to give. And my belief it is, is that those who lose are those that are going to have to give a little in this game, a little more than they've given to date. Uh, and that we're going to work our way through this. No one wants sequestration. So what else, gang? Are you on a negative outlook with the board because of the federal government? Are you still in that mode? We are on Moody's. But I will say to you, and we have had we had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Moody's when we were up there before. Uh, Moody's has five criteria by which it is judging communities that are linked to the federal government, and we're going to go up there and explain to them why they need to change that criteria and why they need to hear from communities as to what they're prepared to do in response to sequestration. So, for example, let's assume for purpose of this conversation that we were to set aside X millions of dollars to account for the lost revenue. Then from my perspective, if we look Moody's in the eye and say, okay, here's our estimate of the impact, and here's what we've done to address that impact, we should be done. Now, if communities aren't in a position to address those impacts, that's a, that's a different situation. But we feel that Moody's is applying a way too broad of a, a brush, if you will, to this issue, and it needs to be more specifically tailored to what a community is impacts going to be and what they're going to do about it. Do you have like an estimate of how much money it would cost the county to put the reserve fund? Say that again. So it's sequestration. Do you have an estimate of how much that would cost? We don't have our own estimate at this point in time. You may have seen that the state put out uh, some numbers last uh, last week, which I believe suggested something on the order of $200 million annually in lost revenue. So uh, I'm going to assume that Montgomery County is, is a piece of that. Uh, and so we have to deal with it. That's in tax revenue. But on the other hand, you know, we're, we're hoping we'll find out in November that see if the economy is picking up a bit as well and that our tax revenues may be a little stronger than we otherwise thought. When are you going to go up to Moody's and have a conversation? We had our first conversation with Moody's when I was on the trip with the county executive uh, and uh, we're in conversation with our chief administrative officer who is perfectly positioned for this. He is president of the Association of Financial Officers for local governments, the national or association. And so he's, he's really perfectly placed and he's having conversations with other communities that are, could be similarly affected and see if we can make a uh, coordinated uh, pitch to Moody's. Just regarding PEPCO. Mm. <laughs> um, what, what, what is your take of this, looking at it, that this is what they're fighting over? What can you just say about the deal in general that there's a greater strike against 
I am reluctant to get in the midst of sort of collective bargaining disputes. Um, I can say that without a doubt, it is not in the public interest for this matter not to be resolved. And I think that's what PEPCO has to understand, that it's not in the public interest for this matter not to be resolved. So I have some sympathy for any worker who is looking at losing potential health care benefits and other uh, benefits of that nature. This is not a time in which people want to lose benefits of that nature. But I can't, I, I really don't know enough about the details and I wouldn't think it's appropriate for me to pine even if I did. Have not have not heard back yet. Do you expect that there ever get a date set? There, there was not. I wanted him to take a good look, and it, it could very well be that he comes back and say, Council President, uh, I stand by my analysis. Um, I just thought it was very interesting because I hadn't focused, and I should have, on the fact that Pepco itself acquired this franchise from another company. Okay, it bought it. So to me, that makes it, if you will, much more like a commodity. And so if it's a commodity, then why is it such that one has to go to the state legislature? Pepco didn't have to go to the state legislature to acquire the franchise. Why would our county or have to do so? So I thought it was worth revisiting. But I really, I want our focus increasingly not to necessarily be fixated on public power per se, because we have to simultaneously pursue two options. We have to pursue the option of what would a 21st century utility look like? And what kind of service do we get? And it really, there are people, very respectable people that are calling for, if you will, a revolution in the way in which re electricity is provided. Uh, and they make no bones about it. That the model that we have of this centralized utility monopoly does not work in any other part of our economy. And we've seen in the telecommunications industry what happened to Ma Bell and what sprung up in its place and how that empowers consumers and creates economic opportunities and, in my judgment, would create a greener, less carbon intensive environment. So it really is stepping back and saying, is this the path that we want to continue going down or can we at least pilot something different? And I think Montgomery County is so perfectly poised to be that pilot. One, it is so important to our future. And two, to have it known that <coughs> Montgomery County is really leading the way in the nation on doing this, I think would serve our state very well as a city. I know, um, I guess last year when Valerie was president, she sought an attorney general opinion on this issue of public power as well. Have you sought anything from the attorney general? Are you asking him to revisit? Um, we asked for that opinion. Right. We asked for him to review the attorney, the, our county's attorney's opinion. And it literally was one sentence, we concur with the county attorney's opinion. So that's why I'm, I don't know how much independent thought went into that analysis. And so far it was rather sparse, shall we say. Uh, so that's why I'm going back to the county attorney and asking them to take a good look. And if they come back and say, you know, this is the path you have to choose, then so be it. So Ken Long Creek, if you do a water service category change, I'm assuming it's that now that we'll be going to sewer, what, how could you protect the creek in your plan or the watershed plan right now? You would be imposing conditions, which we do when we extend sewer to people in lots of situations. We would be telling them precisely what they had to do, how much impervious surface, for example, where they could develop. Um, so you can come close to dictating precisely the terms and conditions uh, that you might otherwise get in a master plan amendment, but the master plan amendment process allows you to step back and really say to yourself, should we do more for town center 
and, and create more density there and give it a real urban node feel, give it a sense of walkability, bikeability, all the things that we're trying to achieve. Uh, give more density there and then look at how much density we, are, we would otherwise permit in areas that are closer to 10 Mile Creek. So that's the fundamental choice that we're my colleagues and I will be struggling with over the course of the next week, and I'm sure I'm not alone in having lots of conversations about this over the course of the next week. What are the residents telling you in these emails? You said you've received hundreds of emails. What are 600. You, tell me, what are they writing about? Are they, do they want more density or are they opposed to it? What they want is 10 Mile Creek to be protected, okay. fundamentally. And I, I believe that most of them basically are, are saying, put more density where it wouldn't affect 10 Mile Creek. I think that they're prepared for more density in the town center. I think they're very concerned about allowing development to take place in close proximity to the headwaters of 10 Mile Creek, given the history that we've seen when development occurs. We have had a creek that was pristine. It is not pristine now. And that's a function of the development that's taken place. Anytime you move that much earth, you can imagine what it does to the sediment, okay? You're moving a lot of earth. That earth gets in the creek. So this issue has sort of particular resonance for me. One, I'm the chair of the committee that has environmental responsibilities. Two, I, I'm a fly fisherman. What does that mean? What that means is trout only live in beautiful streams. And if you put sediment in a stream, you see immediately what takes place to a stream. And I want you to know the difference between a pristine stream and a stream that's not, it's a big deal. Um, so it is something that I think we need to be very judicious about. And it, again, it's been something that has been haunting our, our government for since 1994. It was a very uh, controversial decision to put as much density as was put up there. It was over the objections of the planning board in 1994. Uh, on a 5-4 vote, the council put more density than the planning board had suggested. Mm -hmm. And so the reverberations of that continue to this day. So why is switch? Why is this now back to being an issue? Uh, because the county executive decided to make it an issue by sending over his suggestion that we go forward with the water and sewer category changes since we hadn't done anything on the master plan. And it is amendment. for developments that they're kind of not necessarily proposed, but developers aren't really, I think, considering options for them. Any of those initiatives are really coming forward to you? Well, I assume that those developers have made their presentations to the county executive, and the county executive felt that there was time to, to move on these. I was not given, the county executive did not advise me of his uh, decision to uh, send these matters over in this form. And is there a reason why it has to be decided by October 9th? Well, October 9th is when the uh, planning board comes before us for their semi-annual work plan uh, update, if you will. And so if we believe it's time to make a decision on this issue, which I think most of us believe it is time to make a decision, uh, this would be a logical time to do it because we would direct the planning board to uh, look at this issue in a comprehensive manner and come back and advise us as to where, where w they think we can afford to have uh, more development and where can we not afford to have more development. Because clearly the people of Clarksburg have not gotten what was promised. Um, but what was promised fundamentally was a vibrant town center. And so from my perspective, to the extent to which we're prepared to relook at how much density we could put there and actually add density there, then we create more of an opportunity for greater vibrancy uh, in that community. So that's one of the issues that we'll be talking about. So the water sewer category change does nothing to that issue? Does nothing to that issue. So it is, in some sense, it is what lens do you want to look at this issue through? What's the most rational lens?
to look at this issue. Uh, and so. Did you have a recent meeting with the counties? I thought that was on the um, advisory for the press conference that you were going to brief us on. Say it one more time. Was there on the press release announcement a meeting with the county or did I read we that We had wrong? a meeting with MACO. MACO, yes, that's it. Okay, I apologize. Uh, I thought we talked about that last time, but maybe some of you weren't here last time. Uh, I was here. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about it last time? Uh, we did have a meeting with MACO uh, in which we really were talking about transportation funding sets of issues, uh, particularly whether or not the state is prepared to in any way move forward on transportation okay. funding. And if not, uh, would the state be willing to assist local governments in moving funding, moving forward with local funding of transportation? And I think that that is going to be the fundamental decision that the next legislature is gonna have to, to deal with in the next General Assembly. Because I really think no is not an answer. So if we can't get statewide support for a gas tax or a sales tax or something that significantly replenishes in, uh, the transportation trust fund and provides enough funding for us to move forward with the CCT, the Purple Line, rapid transit, things that are fundamental to our county's future, then we need a means by which Montgomery County, either in partnership with other local governments in the region or alone, <coughs> moves forward. The governor Friday asked for seven hundred fifty million dollars in bonds. I have not heard anything about that. I think that's what you were looking for, I would, I, I would hope so. I haven't been briefed with respect to it, so I apologize. You know more than I do, which most of you often do. And how are you feeling about police bargaining? I'm feeling good. <laughs> do you want to elaborate on that with the letters that went back last week? Well, what, what I would say is that there are only two things in this region that unite Democrats and Republicans. The Nationals and effects bargaining. I know, just deliberate misinformation. I mean, I guess that's a, a nuance that I uh, miss, but I, I think he did say deliberate misinformation. Well, maybe that's not accusing people of lying, but it, it comes close enough where I, I did say essentially. So uh, from my perspective, uh, I, uh, my letter stands, and I think uh, our Democratic Party stands, and I think the Republican Party stands, and uh, so it is a unifying force in our community. Any word on the IG? I have not been advised by the IG that he is. I met with him recently, but uh, he didn't raise this issue with me as on his radar screen at the time. I think we have a county attorney opinion that makes it pretty clear that the county is allowed to advocate for county law. It seems to me that the county ought to be in a position to advocate for its own laws. I hate to bring it back to last week, and I apologize, I missed Neil's note on the time change, but uh, I wanted to talk to you about what, uh, regarding what the county and uh, executive and restaurant council's uh, take is on that and your take is on what was happening with the speed of bargaining, what the county intends to do in the future with this. If you could spin me up on what you talked about last week, I'd appreciate it. Sure. What um, NIH has been very open to sitting down with our county and working towards a memorandum of understanding. Um, which would set forth when and under what circumstances NIH would share with the county things that are going on in their clinic. Um, I, do, I have been very heartened by the openness of NIH. It is, it really is handling this situation, I think, in a most exemplary manner. It's a huge part of our community. It's a huge part of our economy. Uh, and it has responsibilities to our county that they fully understand. And in this particular situation, they had actually advised the state of the situation, and it was the state that dropped the ball in not notifying the county. So we just need to sit down and have candid conversations that in no way intrude upon 
their serious responsibility, recognizing that this is a place of last resort. This is where the people that are the sickest of the sick go for the last gas, the last hope. And they do such an extraordinary job in providing that. So we don't want to get in their way, but we do want to understand uh, what they think is an appropriate protocol for their host county to ensure that our community is fully aware when it needs to be aware. And I'm not uh, a clinician, I'm not close enough to it to say, to draw that red line, if you will. Uh, but I am confident that uh, our public health officer, our director of health, our county executive, the state and our, our chairman of our uh, health and human services committee that we can collectively work through this. Thank you. Sure. All right, gang. Thank you.